Harper in Northwest Arkansas. I live in Northwest Arkansas. But I take pictures of bald eagles all over the state of Arkansas and as far away as Alaska. So some of the images you're going to see here in a minute are going to be eagles from Arkansas all the way to, um, to Alaska. So what, what I hope to do today is to let you see bald eagles like I see them through my lens. This is, by the way, a camera here. The camera sits on the back of this big lens. This is called a 600 millimeter lens. So it lets me sit about 100 yards away from the bald eagle. And when I look through my camera, it's like it's from here to those doors from me. So it really magnifies the bird, and then I can take pictures of it. It looks a lot closer than it really was. So it's a, it's a fun hobby. It's an interesting hobby. But there's a real story behind the bald eagles I'm going to share with you in a little bit. But what I'm going to do first, I'm going to start with a video presentation that I set to music. And you'll see about 100 of my images, my, my pictures, scroll through this video. And these are all eagles that were flying, sitting on a limb, catching a fish. They're doing all the things that eagles do every day. So you'll get a chance to see all the behavior of the bald eagle. And then we'll take a few questions when we get through that. And I'll tell you some more information about the bald eagle that most people don't even know. So we'll, we'll get started with the video. And I hope you enjoy. That's a bald eagle that's just taking flight. They kind of load their wings by keeping them cupped a little bit. This is a bald eagle in Alaska, and he's doing what's called a ground charge. He was charging another eagle to try to take the fish away from him that this other eagle had caught. Now, if you look there, those are bald eagles in those trees. That was a roosting site that I saw one morning that had probably 200 eagles in it. That's a second year bald eagle, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how I know that that's a second year bald eagle. That's a juvenile bald eagle. That's adult bald eagle with the Chilkat Mountains in the background in Alaska. This eagle was cruising the river looking for a fish in the river. That's kind of the way they hunt. They hunt by flying and looking for the fish, and you can see that eagle caught one. If you look at its talons, it's got a small shad in its talons. Eagles sit on a, a perch on a limb overlooking a lake or a river, and they can see a fish from about three, four hundred yards away. Their eyesight is so unbelievable. That's a nest there, and that little gray bird is a baby eagle that I nicknamed Cleopatra. this nest. Normally you have a male and a female eagle in a nest together. What do you see that's different in that nest? There was three eagles, wasn't there? I'll tell you a little more about that after we get through the presentation. And that was on a foggy day that eagle was getting ready to go catch a fish. That's a male eagle. The female was up in the nest and he just left the nest. That's a two-year old bald eagle. And again, it's a juvenile eagle. And all the eagles between one and four years are juveniles, and they become a mature eagle after five years of life. You look here, this eagle had just caught a, a rainbow trout out of the White River up near Gaston's Resort near, near uh, Mount Home. Now, what do, you, what do you think that eagle's carrying there? Hey, he's going to put it in the nest and line the bowl of the nest with that hay where the, where the eggs will be laid. That's an eagle in, a, in just a little bit of a snowstorm there. They vocalize both on the roost and they also vocalize in the ear. That one's vocalizing in the ear. And look at those talons. Those talons have about a five inch spread. If I hold my hand up, from my little finger to my thumb is about five inches. Now in that picture, that's one of those pictures where there's something just not right about it. There, there was an eagle in a picture that had a bunch of blood. Blue heron nest. 
There are just a few bald eagles in that. You see the brown ones? Those are all juvenile eagles. The ones with the white head and the white tail are the mature eagles. That one's grabbing a fish. This one had just tried to grab a fish and unfortunately missed. About 70% of the diet of a bald eagle are fish. This one was just standing in the river, but he's standing on a salmon that he had just caught and was picking away at that salmon, eating that salmon. And look for the little head on the eagle on the left. There's a little gray head there. That was the baby. Mom and dad were, were both feeding him at the, at the time. The wingspan of an eagle can be about six, six feet all the way up to seven feet. So if you look at a door frame, this door frame from the top of the frame to the ground is seven feet. So imagine an eagle with the wings that would cover that door from top to bottom. Those are just two young uh, baby eagles. That's a big female eagle. And I can tell you in a minute how I know that's a female. That's also a female. See how, how tall her wings are? She's beginning to take flight. That's a two-year-old eagle. And this is, a, this is a big eagle, but notice the bump right in its throat. That's called the crop. That's where they, they feed and they, they, they push food down into that crop. And it's a way for them to save that food for later. It's kind of like a refrigerator in their throat, so to speak. Another picture of an eagle picking up a rainbow trout out of the White River here in Arkansas. Another picture of a roof site. This would be a site where eagles gather together at night, spend the night, and then early in the next morning they can get up and go hunting. That's a big Alaskan eagle. You see all those feathers on it? There's 7,000 individual feathers on the body of a bald eagle. You see the one with the mouth open? They always vocalize to each other. When one comes in to land next to an eagle, they'll vocalize to each other. That's a big girl there too. These are two juvenile eagles. You see one on the nest, and then look up in the right hand corner, there's another, and they're both squawking. They're just hungry. They're young eagles that haven't learned to fly very good yet, and they're, they're calling out to their mom and dad, I'm hungry, I need food. Those two on the, uh, the upper ones, those were two juveniles, and then two adult eagles. That's an adult eagle there. The full white head and the full white tail tells you that they are fully adult eagles. This is a two-year-old eagle. And again, the dark one there, that's a baby. That's probably, that baby's probably been uh, born about two months earlier. Have a little fuss and fight there, and that's a, a magpie on the ground there next to me. Now look in front of that eagle, and you'll see the little head of its baby right in front of it. Everybody says that. Now that's two, two young eagles that had just left the nest for the first time learning to fly the day before. I caught them sitting together. That's called a head throwback call. When they throw their head back like that, it's a warning to other eagles that this is my food. Don't even think about coming here and trying to take it away from me. That's a mating pair. That's, that's the male and the female together during the mating season.
always fun to catch a lot of eagles in one spot like that. That's a female eagle. Look at the talons on that eagle. The, the needle nose, the needle black part of their toe can be almost two inches long. Now this eagle had just got that stick by flying into a tree that had a dead limb. It grabbed it with its talons as it went by and let its body weight break the limb and it was flying the limb into the nest to, to continue to build the nest. It's an eagle in a snowstorm. And I was in that snowstorm too. These are two eagles that are fighting. The one on the bottom, uh, they naturally have an instinct when they're being attacked to jump up, roll to the back, and expose their talons up to the, to the eagle that's approaching them to attack them. So it's a way to defend themselves. That's a four-year-old eagle there. This is two, uh, two young eagles that were about three or four weeks away from taking their first flight. That's an eagle that just caught a fish and was flapping his wings into the water so that water with a, with a fast shutter speed on my camera stopped the action. So that's why you see the water hanging in the air like it was. Now the one on the right was the female eagle, the one on the left was the male. You remember me telling about the crop? Look at the big bulge on this one's neck. That's a pretty good sized animal that it had eaten and it was stuck in its crop. And later in the day, he would force that food down into his stomach to, to, to use it for energy, uh, for his uh, activities for the rest of the day. See again, three eagles in that nest. Now, two eagles down at the bottom is mom and dad. The one coming in for landing is juvenile eagle that, that was one of, its, uh, one of its babies. That's a big female eagle there. The female girls is, is the biggest and the baddest of the two eagles. They're much bigger than the male by about 25% bigger. That's a two-year-old. Big adult. That's a female. You get a sense of the size there, but you really can't judge that size until you see one really up close, and then you're just blown away by how big these animals are and how beautiful they are. Now look at this one. He has a fish, and he couldn't wait to land on a tree to eat it, so in flight, he's bending down and eating his uh, fish in flight. Another two-year-old. You can see the one on the left, he's got a salmon that he's standing on. That's a raven and a magpie that's standing there. The, the uh, ravens are pretty smart. They stand around the eagles that are eating salmon and they sneak around behind them and they reach down and they pull one of their tail feathers and when the eagle turns around to try to get them, he goes around the other way and grabs a bite of the salmon and flies away with it. See, every time you see one of these eagles standing in the snow, hidden underneath his talons is a dead a salmon that he's getting ready to eat. Here's another nesting, or excuse me, a, a roosting site of all eagles on the Chilkat River in, in Alaska. That's mom and dad and junior in the background. Now, eagles often play fight in the air. It's just eagles being eagles. There's no, no harm intended, but they love the aerobatics and the flying and the chase that goes on with, the, with that activity. You can see a big mountain in Alaska behind that eagle there. That's a mated pair, again, just vocalizing. It's just another thing that eagles do. This one was on the attack. He was coming in to try to take a fish away from a, an eagle on the shoreline. That's a first year eagle on the left. 
and the second gear eagle on the right. And that is a huge Alaskan eagle right there. You can see there that that eagle's coming in with a stick in his talons. He's adding to the nest during the fall. They begin to rebuild their nest every year and make sure that it's good and secure for the, the, nest, the next nesting season. Again, eagles just play fighting in the air. Those are both juveniles. Here again, you can see on the, on the shoreline there, there's a dead salmon there that the eagles have been eating and they're actually fighting over the food. There's an eagle with, what's that down to the left of you? You might know? It's a great blue heron. And again, you see that nest? That nest would be about seven feet wide and about eight feet deep. They're huge nests and weigh thousands of pounds. There's a young eagle that was um, standing there with its mom. That eagle's just taking flight from the nest. There's three baby eagles. This year that nest had, uh, they had three babies. That's uh, Mulberry and Curly, a nickname on my baby eagles. You can see that eagle bringing in strong for the nest. Again, that goes into the bottom of the nest to make a soft spot for the babies when they're born. on how big that nest is. It is huge. That nest has been active for about uh, nine years now. You see that eagle with the salmon under his, in his talons there? That's a second year bald eagle. That's the nest with the three babies in it. No Larry and Curly and Dad on the right. He's watching them on the left side. You can look at the talents of that bird, that uh, eagle, and that's a, a rainbow trout. where they can't fly away with it. A bald eagle, you've heard, you've heard stories about bald eagles catch, catching someone's dog or their cat and flying away with it. That really doesn't happen. About the biggest weight that they can handle is about three and a half to four pounds. 
But if they catch, get a hold of a fish in the, in the river and they get their talons on it, rather than trying to fly away with it, they will rest stroke with their wings. And they'll rest stroke all the way to the bank and eat the fish on the bank. Yes, ma'am. The biggest eagle that I've ever seen. Bald eagles are about 10 to 14 pounds in terms of weight. I saw one in Alaska that was a good six, 16 pounds and had a wingspan over seven feet. So Alaska, because of the amount of salmon, they have high protein diets there, they grow bigger there, and they're just huge. So that was the biggest one that I've ever seen. Okay, one more, yes ma'am. Yeah, the question is, you know, they have such great eyesight. When they see me standing on the river, can they see me from a long ways away? Absolutely they can. They have amazing eyesight. Experts say that bald eagles' eyes are four times more effective in terms of being able to see things at a long distance than our eyes are. And our eyes are about the same size as the bald eagles. So they have tremendous eyesight. You can see things. I've, I've been watching them on the side of the river, taking pictures, and I'll see an eagle look downstream. A quarter of a mile down the stream, he flies off and goes a quarter of a mile, drops down and catches a fish that he obviously saw a quarter of a mile away. But experts say they can see a rabbit from a, from a mile away. So their eyesight is unbelievably good. Okay, let me... Let me uh, turn to a little slideshow here. I want to show you real quick. <clears throat> Talk a little bit more about Paul Davis. Just a Okay, just, I want to get started with a little bit of the history. A little bit of the history of bald eagles. When you think about uh, eagles through through the time dating back to the, even the 1600s, there were estimated to be 100,000 bald eagles in the uh, United States in, in 1782 when our Continental Congress was looking to identify the symbol of our great country. And do you remember what the symbol of the great country is? Bald it's the bald eagle. That's right. So there's 100,000 at that time when Ben Franklin and the Continental Congress were sitting around the table trying to figure out who was going to be the national symbol. There was a great debate about it, and Benjamin Franklin absolutely rejected the idea of the bald eagle. He felt that they were lazy and that other smaller birds could run them off. And he made a case for why it shouldn't be the wild turkey, which, it, which he wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at a wild turkey and I look at an eagle, those two faces aren't the same and not even close to being pretty, but the bald eagle is much more beautiful and majestic than a wild turkey. So they decided on the bald eagle. Now, if you, if you go forward to the 1950s, the population of bald eagles in our country had dropped to 10,000 nesting pairs. That means there were 20,000 eagles left in North America. So that we went from 100,000, back when the Continental Congress was talking about who was going to be the national symbol, down to, uh, to 20,000 birds in, in the 1950s. Now, look what happens in the next the next little second of time. From 1963, only 487 pairs of eagles were left in North America. And, 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 that, and we, we learned later that was because of the effects of a chemical pesticide called DDT. DDT was a very effective pesticide, but the problem with it is it was, uh, airplanes would spray over crops in places where there's a lot of mosquitoes and it would kill the mosquitoes effectively.
But that chemical went into the water, into the vegetation of the, of the water, and then into to fish in the water. So when eagles began eating the fish, guess what they had in their body? DDT, exactly right. So if you go ahead and scroll forward a little bit more, in uh, 1967, bald eagles were placed on the endangered species list. Now the endangered species list would have what on it? Animals that, yes, yes ma'am. Exactly, animals that are dying, where we may actually lose the entire species of that particular animal and never to, to have them again. So we were that close to the bald eagles going extinct. So they were put on the endangered species list and in 1972 our government banned the use of DDT. From that point forward, we began a recovery in the number of eagles that, that were still alive, that were alive. If you look in Arkansas specifically, there were no successful eagle nests recorded in Arkansas between the years of 1957 all the way up to 1981. Now think about that. There wasn't a single eagle or eagle nest in our state during that time frame. The first recorded successful nest was in 1982. By 2004, there were 42 breeding pairs of bald eagles in Arkansas. So you can see it took it all the way up to 2004 before we started really seeing good numbers beginning to come back in our state. I estimate that today, they kind of quit counting nests, but I would esti estimate today, based on all the nests that I've seen around the state, that we probably have somewhere in the range of 150 nesting pairs that are resident nesting pairs in our, in our state today. So we've had a really nice increase in the number of successful nests. By 1999, eagles were removed from the endangered species list, but are still protected by both federal and state law. Today, over 10,000 nesting pairs in the U.S. exist, and there's an estimated 2,000 eagles that migrate into Arkansas every winter and stay here for the winter, going back, uh, back uh, to the north in the, in the spring. So why do eagles migrate to our area? Just a quick question. Yes, ma'am, Matt, in the back. Because it's warmer here. Essentially, that's, you just hit the nail on the head. Essentially, it's warmer here, and there's a reason behind that. Eagles migrate south because where they live, the ones that we see in Arkansas in the wintertime, have come here for as far away as Canada and also the northern part of the United States. So in wintertime, in that part of the world, there's snow packed on the ground. There may be three or four or five feet of snow packed on the ground. Where would the eagles find food when the ground is covered in snow like that? The answer is they wouldn't find food. So they're forced in order to survive to move further south. Now, what is their primary food? Fish. 70% of their diet are fish. So here's why they come to Arkansas. There's a couple of reasons. They have to come to Arkansas or states like Arkansas where there's open water, where they have lakes, rivers, where they can find fish. Otherwise, they won't make it through the winter. They also come here because in the wintertime, we have thermals in the air. In the north, there are no thermals. So what that means now, does everybody know what a thermal is? Let me just explain. A thermal is a column of warm air that's being heated by the sun, maybe in a in a forest or in a, in a field, a planted field, the heat coming off of those, those items creates a column in the air that goes up. Well, the, you've probably seen vultures up swir swirling around in the sky. They're in a thermal when you see that. The, the air goes up. The eagles benefit from it because it carries them up to high altitude. And then they all they have to do is glide around and come back into that thermal from time to time and let them carry them up again. They don't have to power flap their way through the air. If they had to power flap their way through the air all the time, they would exhaust their energy reserves and wouldn't be able to, to have the activity of, of hunting for the balance of the day because their energy their energy is not there to do that. So they, they come south because we have open water, and they come south because they can get into thermals that conserves their energy. 
When they migrate from the north, they can travel up to 150 miles a day. And many times, just by staying in thermals as they move south, lets them glide through the, through the air and not have to expend a lot of energy. Now, a couple of just interesting facts about bald eagles. Their bones are hollow. And they're light, which helps them in their flight. So uh, they have, a, as I said earlier, over 7,000 feathers. <clears throat> and an eagle can spot prey from a mile away. And their eyes are estimated, again, to be four times more effective than human eyes. Um, the mortality rate of a first year bald eagle, in other words, if an eagle was born in April of this year, in one year, it's estimated that 70% of first year eagles will die that first year. They can't find enough food, or they get into winter, and, they, and, and the winter is too harsh, and they just don't make it. It's kind of shocking that we're losing that many e eagles just due to the climate. But cold, the cold temperatures and not being able to find food uh, kills a lot of the first year eagles. The female eagle is roughly 25% larger than the male. So the females are, are bad to the bone. And the males are a little bit weak when it comes to the eagle world. So, uh, so girls, this is, a, this is a big deal here for you. The 20, the, uh, the 25% larger size makes them more powerful, makes them more formidable in a fight, make them unusually effective hunters. Uh, they can guard the nest by just covering the nest with their big wings and their babies get under the wings and they stay there to, uh, to get uh, protection from any kind of predator that might be coming through. So they are an amazing, uh, amazing creation. If you look over at the picture on the left, that's an adult eagle standing next to a two-year-old eagle. Now, which one of those is larger? Which one? The two-year-old. Looks larger, doesn't it? Well, let me tell you a little story about that. A bald eagle, when it's born, <coughs> gets flight feathers that, that are, um, in the first year, that are longer than an adult eagle. So the baby eagle is getting feathers longer than the adult eagle. Now, does that make sense? Why would it make any sense? Well, the reason it makes sense is because those longer feathers give them a wider wing. And wider wings make it possible for the eagle to be able to, to land slowly, to be able to learn to fly more effectively, to not be able to, to go too fast and lose control. So the main thing for a young eagle is they've got to be able to control their flight. So isn't it interesting that our, the Creator gave these eagles longer feathers to give them the ability to fly slower and more, fit, more efficiently? Now, guess what happens the second year? Eagles every year molt out their feathers from the prior year and bring in new feathers. The body creates new feathers along the wing. What do you think happens to those long feathers when they molt the second year? Yes, sir. What do you think? They, they are now shorter the second year. And the reason they're shorter is because now they can be more maneuverable, they can be faster, they've already learned to fly after the first year, so now they have shorter wings that make them more easy to catch prey. Makes it more easy for them to catch prey. Now, you know, I was talking to you about how, how I know these, these different uh, eagles or what certain names they are. It takes five years for an eagle to develop the full white head of feathers and the full white tail of feathers. So, during the first four years of life, each year the eagles molt in a different feather pattern than the year before. So once you learn what that feather pattern looks like, and like on the uh, second, the second year you go over in the corner over here, it's got a little bit yellow in its bill, it's got a black tip, it's got the white spotted chest. Those are signals that's a second year eagle. A third year eagle has a whole different pattern of, of feathers. The fourth year eagle looks a lot like a mature eagle except it has 
dark head, and it has a, a little bit of a dark spot on the head and a little bit of dark uh, coloration on the tail. So that's how you tell. This just gives you an example of what, how big an eagle is. The guy holding that is a friend of mine who is a, a professor at the North Texas State University. They had caught that eagle in a, in a research study, and he's a big guy. He's over six feet tall, but you can see it covers his whole upper body all the way down to past his knees. So they're huge. And you look at his hand and look at the talons in the feet of that eagle. What was that? It looks like, yeah, sure does. Okay. And this, this shows you the differences. The first year eagle is almost all dark brown or, or almost black. The second year eagle has the white pattern that's beginning to, to mold. And it looks like it has a v-neck sweater. If you look at the dark pattern on its breast there, that's another indicator that's a second year eagle. The third year eagle is beginning to get some white on the tail and a little bit of white on the head, but it has this dark eye band going right through its eyes. That's the message that it's a third year eagle. And then the fourth year eagle has an almost white tail and an almost a white head, but you see some, some dark coloration on that. That just means he's not quite mature. When they receive the white head and white tail, they're able to mate with their, with their mate and begin to have babies and nest. Again, this is just a comparison of the first year eagle on the left to the uh, second year juvenile on the right. <clears throat> Here again is, is uh, looking at the nest of, of two different nest sites uh, with this eagle pair. The one on the left shows a big stick that he uh, bringing into the nest. They do one of two things to get those sticks. I used to think they just fly down on the forest floor and find a stick laying on the ground and take it in the nest. Well, they don't want that. They want a stick that they break out of a tree. So they fly, if they see a, a, a limb from a tree and they think it's about the right size for the nest, they fly to that limb, grab it with their talons, to let their body weight break it, and then they fly into the nest. The other way they get the nest is they fly onto a limb that has a, that has a stick that they want to get. They step out onto that limb and they bounce. And they bounce until it breaks and then they fly off with it and go to the nest with it. It's really interesting to watch them do that. <clears throat> Here's just a, a, a number of different nests that you can see. Every one's a little bit different. Some are big and broad and wide. Some are kind of narrow. The one in the lower left-hand side is one that I've been following for over 10 years. And it today is about two times the size of that, that nest that you see in that picture. So it's a, they're amazing at what they do. The largest nest on record weighed three tons. That's 6,000 pounds. And it was up in the top of a big tree and it was so heavy that a big uh, storm came up and the weight of that nest just carried it, the whole tree to the ground. And they got a, they got a big backhoe and a, and a scale and lifted it with a scale and it weighed six, six uh, tons. I'm sorry, three times with 6,000 pounds. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, I think you're fine. Go ahead and skip that one. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, this is the, the nest building activity. You can see in some of the pictures there, they're carrying in the straw for the bowl of the nest. That's the bottom part of the nest. And then others that are carrying the sticks. Now, when you think about the bald eagle, it is probably one of the most powerful, dynamic predators on the globe in terms of the bird world. Uh, the best time to see them is almost always in the morning. So if you get, if you get someone that tells you where an eagle's been feeding, it's best to get there in the morning because there's more activity during the morning feeding than uh, any other time of day. Again, the preferred prey is going to be fish. So you want to be at most likely a, a river, a creek, a lake, somewhere where there's a body of water where they can catch fish. Now, when the food is in high supply, eagles continue to feed aggressively even though they're well fed. And there was an example in one study. A researcher observed an eagle consuming a 1.5 pound salmon. If you look at that, the size of that fish that it ate, 1.5 pounds, that fish was almost the equivalent of 15% of the body weight of the eagle. 
Now, if a human consumed that same percentage of food, an average human would have to uh, eat 24 pounds of food in one meal to compare to what that eagle swallowed in that one pound of 0.5. Now, anybody had a 24 pound uh, hamburger lately? Or so yeah, it's a, it's a big amount of food. Okay. Again, do eagles carry off dogs, cats, calves, babies, etc.? The answer is no. They don't. They can't carry that kind of weight. Eagles have an instinctive ability, though, to find weak or injured or sick animals. Rather than try to find uh, an animal that's going to be uh, aggressive and trying to fight back or run off, they prefer something that's weak that they don't have to expend a lot of energy on. Uh, I've, I've seen them like a flock of gulls that go in and flush a flock of gulls. And they instinctively know which are the young ones, and which are the sick ones, or which ones are the injured ones, and that's the ones they go after because they can more quickly capture that type of prey and not expend a lot of energy. <clears throat> now, the weapon of the, of the eagle is the talons. Even though they have a big hook on their beak that looks kind of serious, that's not the weapon. That the weapon are the talons. Now, this this is really interesting. You got to get get your head around this, these talons. These talons generally have a five-inch spread and have a grip pressure of over 750 pounds per square inch. That means if I had a 50 cent piece and I put it on the back of my hand and had about three grown man, men stand on that 50 cent piece, the pressure they would put on my hand would be the equivalent of what an eagle grasps when it grabs prey or what it would do if it grabbed your arm. A young child who would inadvertently get grabbed by someone holding an eagle, you would literally hear bones break when you squeeze down on a, on a young child's hands or, or, or uh, arm. They, that 750 pounds is something that when they, they grab an animal with that, they do not get away. And generally what results in their death is they squeeze that animal until they can't breathe anymore. They collapse the lungs and they just hold them until they, until they pass away. This is a bald eagles with fish. Again, you can see they oftentimes are so hungry, they try to eat the fish even while they're flying. The other thing that, that bald eagles do, they're, they're great hunters, but they're even better scavengers. Because of the low energy level that they have, they want to find food that's easy for them to get. So if they can find a dead fish lying on the, on the shore of a, of a, a river, like what happened here in Alaska, that's what they would prefer to have. So they, uh, they tend to, uh, to be a scavenger. You'll find them if somebody shot a deer out in the, in the woods and it got away and it died in the field. A lot of times you'll find eagles on that dead carcass eating the, the, the uh, deer. Okay. Cooperative nesting, I'm gonna just touch real briefly on that. Remember the nest that had three adult eagles in it? I found that nest about nine or ten years ago. And generally when a, a nesting pair is on the nest, they will not tolerate any other eagle to get anywhere close to their nest site or to their hunting territory. But I was shocked to see that particular day, three eagles sitting in that nest, all getting along and all at the beginning of nesting, the nesting period. Now, as the years went by, I found this nest over and over again with all three eagles in that nest working together. The, thir the third eagle that was in that nest was a young male, and he was, a, but he was an adult. Now, eagles, by the way, live up to 30 years of age. And when they mate, they mate for life. So how is it that there's a third eagle in this nest getting along and sharing the duties of that nest with the, with the regular pair that I had been watching years before as just a two pair nesting pair of eagles. Well, it's actually a phenomenon that happens across North America in very small numbers. It's called cooperative nesting. And cooperative nesting is when an, an eagle pair allow for whatever reason a third eagle to join that pair in the, in the normal duties of parental birds in terms of taking care of the chicks, feeding the chicks, defending the nest, all the things that adult eagles do, um, 
This third eagle is part of that. Now it's helpful to the other eagles for this third eagle to be there because they're sharing work responsibilities. So the, the regular male and female get a, get a break basically by this other eagle helping out in that, in that nest. So it's an interesting phenomenon, and this is the only nest that I know of in the whole state of Arkansas, in fact, in the whole region of that where we live, that this, this extra eagle, this is called a, it's called a helper eagle, uh, is, is going on. In fact, if you look across the whole North American continent, you probably would only five, find five or six nests that, that are that way. So it's a very rare thing. This nest is located on the White River just below Gaston's Resort near uh, Mount Home, Arkansas. So it's a very interesting thing to see and it's a very rare thing to see. And that's what that nest looks like when you catch all three of the nests. They're all getting along and all working together. Here's a couple more pictures. Now these other two nests are the same, the same eagles but both of those nests were blown down in a thunderstorm at different times. So this was the first one that I saw was the one back in this kind of valley with a bunch of vines, and that was the one eagle there next to it, and then these others on a different nest that got blown down uh, a little later on. Again, this is funny, it's just one of those pictures when I ask you what's not right in that picture. What you're looking at in these, these other nests are all blue heron nests. And each of those nests have a baby blue heron in it. That eagle up in the right could take one of those babies anytime he wanted to, but he chooses not to for some reason. That nest is right next door. You can throw a rock and hit the eagle's nest. But the interesting thing that's, that stu studies have shown when this happens, the, there's a better survival rate in the blue herons because if another uh, eagle comes into this area that doesn't have a nest nearby, guess what this eagle does? He attacks it. He runs it out of his nesting territory because his nest is just right next door to this. So these eagles, this, these blue herons, benefit by having the devil next door watching over their area because they will not allow any other eagles to come into that area. Thank you for being here today. It's, it's not every day you get a chance to, to talk to 125 fifth graders, and I thought they were, they were really uh, patient. And, uh, but uh, normally I usually have more adults and, than, than children when I, and I, when I make presentations. Um, one of the things I always get asked that I want to mention to you is that how, many, how much time do you have invested in each of the photos that you have in, in the presentation? And, and I would tell you that my best guess would be about two to three hours of wait time for every picture that I get that I would want to show you. In other words, that's what I feel would be a quality image. So this is a hobby for people that have a high degree of patience, I assure you. And I, the, the thing that, that may be the only area that I excel in is I'm highly patient and I can wait it out longer than my buddies that, uh, that sometimes are with me. Um, but it, the bald eagles have been a passion for me. Uh, the first one that I photographed back in the mid 1980s uh, just captivated me. And you'll find that in the, every wildlife photographer, we're all a little bit of an addict. When you get that one picture that you really thought was good, then you get another one that's a little bit better. Now you don't want to, now you don't want to settle for anything than, than the perfect picture. And you never get there but it's one of the things that you're always kind of struggling with. Um, one of the things that we can talk about, and those of you who have an interest in, in photography, we can, we can talk about that in a little bit, but I want to tell you the story here about what I call 2M. You just notice the date there, that was on January 1st, 2012. I'm out at, the, at, at a lake, it's a swept coal power plant lake in Northwest Arkansas. And I saw this eagle coming right over the, the lake and he's coming in my direction and I literally had to turn my camera up at a big angle to get that shot. You can tell I, 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 I shot the underside of the eagle with his, his uh, wings extended. But do you notice anything unusual about him? He's got bands, doesn't he? There's a pink band and a, and a silver band. 
The pink band is, is an indicator of state where that bird was banded. The, the, the silver band is a national band that's registered in the, uh, in the national database for birds. But I was excited when I got home and, and put this, this picture on my computer because I could read the number on the band, which was 2M on the band. So then I got all Twitter painted about it, and I thought, well, I've got to find out where this bird came from and as much as I can. So I contacted folks at the native database, presented the number to them and the color of the band, and they said, well, we'll see what we can find out, and we'll have someone call you if we can confirm where this bird was banded. About two weeks later, I get this call on the cell phone. I'm at, uh, at my office, still working at the time, and, and wasn't uh, retired. And um, this guy says, Mr. Martin, um, are you the one that photographed my bird, my, my eagle? And I said, your eagle? He said, yes. He said, uh, 22 years ago, I, along with a couple of people that worked for me, climbed a, a, a tree on a little island in the middle of Carter's Lake in, in uh, just outside of uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And um, he said, we branded that bird and it's two siblings, a female and a male. And this bird was a male. And I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, we, we, we banned this. And he said, I can't tell you how excited I am because we ban these eagles all the time. And it's very rare that we ever get anything but a carcass of a dead eagle that has one of our bands. He said, to get a live eagle is one thing, but to get a live eagle flying is another thing. And he said, I, I don't know that we've ever gotten a, a, a confirmation of a band from a photograph of an eagle in flight. And I said, well, I certainly have never gotten it, and it was just a lucky shot. But I was all excited. We talked a long time about how it, how it was to climb the tree and to get in the nest and then to protect yourself while the parent birds are swirling around you while you're trying to get the babies on the ground so you can take a blood sample and, and all the scientific uh, measurements that you want. And uh, so we just kind of bonded a little bit. <clears throat> so that, that happened on January 1st, when the first time, first sighting that I got. Now, he was, he was born in uh, 1996 on a nest site. It was the Clinton Reservoir. I'm sorry, I said Carter Reservoir. I meant Clinton, just outside of Lawrence, Kansas. And, he, and again, he was born with a brother and sister, and they were all three tagged by researchers at the late nest site. And as of today, he would be 25 years of age. So he's on the tail end of his whole life cycle now. Now, a year later, a year and five days later, on January the uh, 6th of 2013, I'm at a different lake. I'm at Silent Springs City Lake, and I happen to see this eagle flying toward me down the shoreline. Snap a picture, and I get home. It was kind of a dreary day. The light was not good. But I snapped that picture, and I got home, and I, I saw that there was a pink band on the leg, and at first I, I couldn't comprehend that there would be any way that that is 2M again. It's been a year ago, and it's a different place. And I get to looking, and I blow the picture up, and lo and behold, it's 2 him again. Now, I, I told my wife, when my wife came in, I said, Sharon, you've got to see this. You're not going to believe this. And I said, on top of that, go out and buy all the lottery tickets that you can get, <laughs> because I think our ship has come in today. The odds of this are astronomical, that I could stand in front of this bird a second time a year later. So it was just a great thing. I told all my buddies about it. I was so excited and used it in programs that I was doing at the time. And this was also in the same year, 2013. Again, I'm at a different date. I'm over at the, the same lake, Sound Spring Sea Lake. I see these two eagles coming in, and I see, see them land. And if you'll notice, the one on the left is smaller, so that's a male eagle. The one on the right is the female, much, much bigger, broader. Uh, animal, and if you, you can't really see it real clear, but you can see the pink band on the left, on the right leg, and the, the silver band on the left leg as, as he's landing. So he was there with his mate, and in just a few days later, they had rejoined. Now, one of the interesting things about research with eagles when they migrate is they almost never migrate with their mate. The female may go to Oklahoma, the male may come to Arkansas, but they join back up in the spring when they get when they get back to their nest territory in the north. So it's like 
hey, we need a break from each other. If you go over your way, I don't mind. We'll see you in the next site back in the spring. And so they, uh, they hung around together for a few days and took a few more pictures. But, uh, yeah, that, that was, was an amazing experience to see this happen a second year. So let's fast forward now to 2017 in December. I'm at the Sweat Cold Lake again. I see this eagle land on a point out to my left. I can see him looking down in the water. He's standing on his perch and he's just trying to see what's going on in the water. And all of a sudden he comes off and he goes down for a fish. Missed the fish, but he goes up to land in this tree. And again, that's a, a far shot there when you, when you look at it. But lo and behold, 2 a.m. again. So, what, four years from the first sighting, or, I'm sorry, five years from the first sighting, here he is again. So I'm just enthralled by this whole story. I almost feel like this is a spiritual connection to this bird, and I'm telling everybody about the story, and somebody said, you ought to put that on Facebook. Just write up a story, the story about this, all the facts. So I did. I wrote, I wrote the story at 2 a.m., and I posted it on some social media sites that are where eagle lovers kind of hang out and, and share their, their photos. And I did that kind of late in the day. Early evening, I get a message on, on Facebook, and it's a guy named Dan Staples, and he says, Mike, I know this bird. I, I'm thinking, what kind of crackpot is this? And so I, I told my wife, I said, I don't even know if I'm going to respond to this guy or not. But he had my curiosity up. So I, I messaged him back and I said, Dan, uh, what do you mean you know this, this eagle? He said, I've been photographing this eagle for the past five years at Lowe's Bluff, a national wildlife refuge up in the northwestern corner of, of Missouri. And he said, uh, his nest site is here. So he said, you're basically photographing in the wintertime when he's migrating. I'm photographing him in the spring when he's on the nest with his mate. And I'm thinking, this cannot be real. And so it was just an amazing thing. So Dan and I became friends because we both had a love of the same, the same eagle. So if you look at, at when Dan and I connected, we started trading notes. He told me, he said he knows this eagle. My sighting was on uh, December 28th, 17. His next sighting was in January, following that, on January 9th, 2018, at Los Bluff. So that meant that 2M had to have left where I saw him in northwest Arkansas and traveled. Los Bluff by car is about a five-mile drive, a five-hour drive from, from northwest Arkansas. So it's a, it's a, for an eagle to make that trip, it was probably a two-day journey for him to get there. So he, he was just there at Swept Coast Lake, and now he's in Lowe's Bluff, um, where he, he's been nesting for, on, on a regular basis there for several years. Um, Dan still continues to, to see him in, in, in the spring of the year on the nest site there in Lowe's Bluff. He's invited me to come up and, and uh, go out and, and, and photograph the nest, and I hadn't had a chance to during COVID to be able to break away and do that. But that's one on my bucket list for this spring is go up and visit this bird that's been my buddy for several years. And uh, we, but we just had the greatest time talking and sharing stories and pictures that we, we'd taken of him. But it, it was just an amazing set of coincidences that you just don't ever see in, in the wildlife photography world. Okay. okay. So what questions is it? Would you like to ask about bald eagles? Are there questions that someone would like to ask that uh, didn't answer for you while we were talking earlier? Where is most of the actual nesting of bald eagles in Arkansas? What part of the state? Well, it's really widely dispersed. If you go all the way to eastern Arkansas, the flatlands, the rice and soybean country, but there's a lot of backwater areas that are along sloughs and rivers, like the Cache River and some of those rivers over there, there's eagle nests along those, all those rivers. The White River, Bay, the Rock River is the most pro prolific area of nest sites in the state. So if you, if you go to Bull Shoals and you start downstream, and you go all the way to where it is in the Mississippi River, you're going to see eagle nests all the way down that river in good numbers of them. Uh, 
But I would tell you that there's two different things that you, you want to know about eagles. There are resident native pairs of bald eagles in our state. By that I mean they don't migrate. They were generally born and raised in Arkansas. They have a nest site here. They have a mated, that they're a part of a mated pair. They don't migrate north, nor do they go south from here. They're year-round eagles that you can see all year round. Uh, the eagle nest that, that I was talking about with the three eagles on it, that literally is about a mile below Gaston's Resort, downstream from Gaston's Resort, and it would be on the south shoreline of the river. And it's, they've, been in the, they've been in several, three different nest sites along the river there, uh, but they've been there for the past 11 years that I know about. I actually have family portraits of all the babies that have been born over the 11 years that came out of that, that nest and that, those uh, three eagles there. Um, but that third eagle was one that really threw me in for a loop. Generally, when you see a third eagle come in to a normal eagle nest where there's, where there's a mated pair on the nest, there's going to be a serious attack that's going to happen to that eagle. They don't tolerate them in their nest site or in their hunting territory because food is limited supply. If they tolerate them, then the next thing you know, there's going to be another one coming into the, into the territory. So they always send a very strong, harsh message that you're not in a place where you're welcome right now. And they run them out of that territory very quickly. So it was such a strange thing to see that and not really understand what was going on. I thought it was just a temporary, isolated incident until uh, the next three or four years go by and I see them all the time, every time I go over there. But it's really, it's really a heartwarming because the two males during mating season, right before mating season, there's a bonding period between eagles. And the two, the, two, uh, the male and the female will nuzzle beaks together. They sit real close on their perch limb. They sit real close in the nest. And they go through this rebonding every year. In fact, I think we could learn something about our own marriages if we would periodically schedule rebonding with our, with our mates. But uh, they bond, and it's just a, it's a tender, loving kind of a relationship that you see with them. Um, and then, uh, and they're just great parents. This third eagle, I nicknamed him Slick because he had a really tight, nappy, uh, white head and was kind of skinny when I first saw him. And uh, he would uh, he would come in, and his 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 thing was bringing sticks and straw into the nest. And the female would get really irritated at him because it, it's not like guys how it happens. You know, if you buy a new piece of furniture or something. The last thing you're supposed to do when you get home with your wife is tell her where you want that to be placed. You want her to decide where it's going to be placed, otherwise you're in real trouble. At least that's the way it is in my home. Uh, but she controls where the sticks are going to be placed, so to speak. And the eagles, the female eagle does the same thing. When the male comes into the nest, the first thing he does is hand the stick over to the female. And she will, re if he places it in the nest, she comes over and just goes, puts it over somewhere else, you know, immediately. She just does not want him to place that stick. And that's just her role, and it's instinctive. It's, it's, it's amazing how they, they just do that. And it's common in all mated bonds that I've seen with other eagles and other nest sites. So it's fascinating to watch. Yes, ma'am? Is the third eagle an offspring of the Well, there's no way to know without DNA tests. But I've done some research on that, and there are some DNA studies where this same phenomenon has happened in other parts of the country. And I would say about 40% of the time, they do get a DNA hit that shows that that is actually one of, the, one of their former siblings. And, but what's weird is, you know, this, this was a, when I first saw Slick, he was a fully mature eagle, which means that he lived five years away from this mated pair before he came back and became part of the nest. Now, keep in mind, this is in Arkansas and they are resident birds. There's a limited number of suitable mates for a single bird like that in Arkansas because there's almost all the eagles that are resident birds are mated pair with a nest. So for whatever reason, they allowed him to come back. And I remember the first few times I saw him, they were real patient with him. They would run him out if he did something stupid or you know something they didn't like. But right now, the relationship, you could not stand there and determine which of the two males is the, is the real, because they're, they're doing the same work, they're sharing the duties equally, 
that are such good parents. I mean, they, of course, you know, they live on the White River, which is just full of trout. So they never lack for food for the babies. But uh, he's an amazing provider. And he is, if you, a blue heron gets too close to the nest, he's the first one out of the nest chasing them off. So it's just a, it's an amazing thing to, to see. And again, in my experience, it's been a, a number of years that this has been going on. So, but they're, they're all approaching the end of their life cycle, which, which is going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, but they do mate for life. If they lose a mate, they will remate with, a, with another eagle. Um, but just a fascinating story. They go to the Pacific Northwest. So there, this was in Haines, Alaska, where most of the eagle photos that I showed that were Alaskan. Uh, in, in Haines, you know, from there down to the Pacific Northwest is kind of a straight subtle of a shot for them to, to get down into that area. But they, the eagles have known about the Chilkat River, which is where I was at, for eons of time. And the Chilkat is a spring-fed river, unlike a lot of the other rivers in Alaska. Therefore, it doesn't freeze as early as some of the others, and it's also the site of the last salmon run, chum salmon run, in all of Alaska. So eagles apparently are passing along that knowledge because literally within a, about a three, four mile stretch of river, there was 3,000 eagles. The eagle count was done right before I got there. You know, it was, this was in November. And so they, there was 3,000 eagles. And there was never a time that I couldn't look out and, and count 200 eagles in front of me. And they were so focused on feeding and building up the protein reserves in their bodies that I was taking pictures from me to you guys that, that close. It was really too close. With a big lens, you can't take a picture that close and not have it just completely occupying you know, the, whole, the whole image. But yeah, it's fascinating place. If you ever get a chance to go, it's, it's a place I highly recommend, but you've got to go in November. And there were, most of the days were 26 degrees, and I have pictures of myself covered with three or four inches of snow on my head, and my, my camera gear was covered in snow, and it, but I didn't want to leave. I came back with over 10,000 pictures of all these. Yes, ma'am. Well, what I, what I do is I volunteer to every group that's ever asked me to come and talk about bald eagles because I try to share my passion for them and I try to tell the story of how far they, 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 they come from back from DDT and all that's gone on there. Um, and, you know, there's nothing I wouldn't do. They're, they're my favorite subject in all the photography work that I do. And so my, my goal is to hit as many of these young guys as I can hit with kind of the story, and hopefully something about that the eagles captivate them. Um, you know, there was one woman, and I'm trying to remember her name, that led the studies on DDT and fought the political battles and wrote a book. Uh, Rachel. Yes, that's it, Rachel, and it was Silent Spring or something like that was the name of her book. Changed the whole world, changed the whole course of the bald eagle with the work that she did. And I love that. I love those kind of stories, but you never know where we're going to find another one of those authors or another one of those scientists or another one of those passionate nature lovers that's going to make a difference in a species that's, uh, that's under attack for whatever reason. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, that's the kind of thing I do. I, I wouldn't be good in the, in the political realm or the scientific realm. I just try to share the passion about the, the eagle and let, let those that, uh, that have the ability to take would you tell everybody about the center in Northwest Arkansas? About what? The center, the, the center that, that you have a lot of your photographs. Oh, yeah. There, there's a, a wildlife center in, in that new one that the hunt tank funded. Um, and I have a gallery there that, uh, that we set up. And, you know, galleries are another way that I kind of get an opportunity to get in front of people and talk about bald eagles. And so uh, I do that every chance I get get a chance, especially when retired now, it's just something that, that's really a worthwhile activity for me to be able to share the work that I've done in photography and, and the knowledge that I've gained. The thing that has helped me the most, I'm in the process of writing a book with a friend of mine who's a PhD in wildlife biology, Dr. Jim Lawrence, 
who is uh, at North Texas State right now. And we're about 75% done in, in the book. Uh, our, unfortunately, COVID got in the way with our publisher. We were really getting close where we thought we could begin getting into the print and final editing, uh, but boy, it just devastated the publisher. And so we're kind of on hold again. So hopefully we'll get that going again. That's been a, a good four year project for both of us. And he's just an amazing raw mycologist and uh, learned so much from him just to be around. And I, I do the editing and the illustrations, and he does the original research. And, and, uh, so yeah, we're, we're excited. Hopefully we'll get that published soon.